Welcome back Chemistry 30. In this video we'll look at section 8.4, bond polarity and electronegativity. Um, so last time we looked at um, covalent bonding and we looked at how that works with electron sharing. So that was oh, too far back. So right back here we looked at that um, and we looked at how separate atoms form an octet due to that sharing. So now we'll look at, okay, what happens if we have a Cl2 molecule, an H2 molecule compared to, let's say, HCl or NaCl, etc.? What happens with that? How is the sharing happening when we have two different nonmetals together? So when we have two identical atoms bonded, Cl2 or H2, the electron pairs are shared equally. When two atoms for, uh, from opposite sides of the periodic table, such as NaCl, there is a relatively little sharing because the chlorine completely pulls the electron away from sodium. Sodium becomes plus one, chlorides minus one, so they connect together due to those opposite charges. So we have two extremes here. Equal sharing, no sharing. But what happens with all of those that are in between? The bonds that are found in most substances fall somewhere in between these two extremes. Bond polarity is a measure of how equally or unequally the electrons in any covalent bond are shared. A nonpolar covalent uh, bond is one in which the electrons are shared equally. And we'll see that the word polar implies that there's going to be a charge, one side being positive, the other side being negative, due to pulling more electrons in one vicinity versus another. But if we look at Cl2 and N2, both equal. In a polar covalent bond, however, one of the atoms exerts a greater attraction for the bonding electrons than the other. If the difference in relative ability to attract electrons is large enough, the electron is completely stripped away, and we get a negative charge and a positive charge formed, and we have an ionic bond. Okay? Electronegativity is what we're going to use to determine whether a uh, molecule is polar or not, and the degree of polarity. Uh, so we're going to use that to estimate uh, between uh, whether a bond is nonpolar, covalent, polar, covalent, or ionic. Electronegativity is defined as the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract electrons to itself. The greater an atom's electronegativity, the greater the ability to attract electrons to itself is. The electronegativity of an atom in a molecule is related to the atom's ionization energy and electron affinity, which are properties of isolated atoms, but here we're talking about in molecules. In an atom with a very negative electric electron affinity, so wanting a, an electron, and a high ionization energy, uh, both attracts electrons from other atoms and resists having its electrons pulled away, and therefore it has a high electronegativity. When it's in a molecule, it wants to uh, have the electron in its area more often. Electronegativity values can be based on a variety of properties, not just ionization energy or electron affinity. The American chemist Linus Pauling developed the first and most widely used electronegativity scale, which is based on thermochemical data. And it shows generally, and now if we take a look here, there's a chart at the bottom. You don't have to memorize it, but you'll be able to see some um, trends. Just like with other things on the periodic table, there are certain trends. So if we look, to the, look over here, you can see the numbers that represent a electronegativity va value. Uh, mine is in color, yours is black and white unfortunately, but you can see that the largest one is fluorine, which makes sense because fluorine wants one more electron. It's an extremely small atom, which means the nucleus will be able to attract an electron that's close to it due to not many shells to go through. So 4.0 and then over here the lowest one is cesium. So cesium doesn't really want an electron, in fact it wants to lose it. And since cesium is all the way down here, there are quite a few energy shells or energy levels added on, so it has a v the nucleus has a very weak pull on that outer electron. So you can see the trend there. If we go across uh, a period, increasing electronegativity, which makes sense because as we get to the noble, if we get to the nonmetals, they want an electron to get to the noble gas. Want an electron, really want an electron. So increases as we go left to right and increases as we go up because the smaller the atom is the greater the pull the nucleus will have on an outer electron because that electron will be closer to the nucleus therefore the nucleus can pull it in. 
So we'll highlight that, generally an increase in electronegativity from left to right across a period. That is from the most metallic to the most non-metallic elements. And of course there are some exceptions there, especially in the transition metals. And electronegativity decreases with increasing atomic number. So it gets smaller as we go down, or I like to think of it as it increases as we go up. So increased left to right, increase up. Fluorine is the highest one at 4.0, and that makes cesium the smallest at 0.7. Now you don't need to memorize these values. Instead, you should know the periodic trends and be able to predict which of the two elements is more electronegative, and we can do many things uh, from that as well. So if we look here, uh, electronegativity and bond polarity, we can use the difference in the electronegativity between two atoms to gauge the polarity of the bond of the atoms formed. Um, consider these fluorine containing compounds. So if I look at fluorine gas, it's just simply two fluorines together and the, of course the electronegativity is 4.0 and 4.0 so subtract so everything is equally shared. We don't have a value here so we say that is nonpolar. There is no, it's a simply an equal distribution of electrons between both elements. One is not stealing those electrons more than the other one. HF, so again F is 4.0. H, if we look back, is 2.1. So 4.0 minus 2.1, 1.9. So that is definitely polar. And we know that HF is a, a, a covalent molecule, so polar covalent. Then if you look at fluorine combined with lithium, now lithium we know is a metal, so we have an idea that's going to be ionic, but let's just look at a value here. 1.0 is what lithium is. So 4 minus 1.0, 3. So that kind of gauges us or gives us a figure that, yeah, maybe a difference of 3 could imply ionic. Uh, 2 or less, we have uh, something that's covalent, but it's polar because there's a difference in numbers there. And no difference, that means it's nonpolar. So it's equally distributed. Here, oh, fluorine has the electrons most of the time. And oh, yeah, fluorine has it so much that it completely ripped it from lithium and forming an ionic bond. So in F2, the electrons are shared equally between the fluorine atoms, and thus covalent bond is nonpolar. A nonpolar covalent bond results when the electronegativities are equal, of course, so we don't get a number here. In the HF, the fluorine atom has a greater electronegativity than hydrogen, which results in the electrons shared unequally. So we say the bond is polar. In general, a more polar covalent bond results when the atoms differ in electronegativity. In HF, the more electronegative fluorine attracts electron density, or the, the, those outer electrons away from the less electronegative hydrogen, leaving a partial charge on the hydrogen atom and a partial negative charge on the fluorine. So we can think of it like this. And what's classically done is the Greek symbol delta is used here. And to draw that, it looks like a funky D. So it looks kind of like that. So that's what that symbol is there. So it leaves a partial charge because fluorine is pulling the electrons in its direction more frequently than what hydrogen has. So of course, if it's pulling electrons, it's getting partially negative. And of course, if we're losing electrons here from the hydrogen end, it becomes partially positive. So the Greek symbol delta here means partial charges, partial positive and partial negative. So whatever is pulling the electrons away, the more electronegative atom, it's going to be slightly negative, leaving slightly positive behind, and therefore it's going to be polar. And in LF, the electronegativity difference is very large, meaning that the electron density is completely shifted towards F. The resulting bond is therefore more accurately uh, described as ionic. The shift in electron density towards the more electronegative atom in a bond can be seen in the results of calculations of electron density distributions. For three species in our example, the calculated electron density distributions are shown down below in the figure. And we'll look at that in the next video, and uh, we'll see you shortly.